Remember a couple of weeks ago when everyone was concerned about how few people are being killed in the Battle of Winterfell? Remember the sad knowing nods of those Sage fans who knew that major deaths tend to not happen in big impersonal action sequences? Those fans knew this was coming. Despite the penultimate episode of Game of Thrones' final season once again dividing fans, it cannot be said that it wasn't an incredible feat of cinematography, emotional filmmaking and spectacle. Yeah, you may not agree with all of the story beats, who does? But if TV shows are to be judged on how they make you feel and the images they print indelibly into your brain, this was a resounding, devastating success. And with so much happening, inevitably there's a lot to unpack ahead of the finale. So here it goes from one last time before the last time. I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com and this is everything we learned in the bells. Number 11, those retired characters really are safe. A small thing, but if you were worried that Tormund, Ghost and Gendry were being given happy endings, aside from Gendry losing his beloved of course, only to be brought back and killed sneakily, you need not worry. Both Christopher Hivju, I'm sorry if I mangled that, and Joe Dempsey have now been removed from the opening credits, which is usually an indication only of death. For them to have been cut means that they're no longer active characters, which means we can all go back to imagining Ghost and Tormund frolicking in the snow instead of having serious charred people flashbacks. Number 10, the good of the realm. On reflection, we should have realised where the episode was going as soon as Lord Varys' story came to an end in the opening act. Having realised that Jon was the preferable heir to the throne, Varys did what he always does, apparently attempting to poison Danny using a child in Dragonstone's kitchens and sending out notices to anyone and everyone to spread the news of Jon's true parentage, which cost him his life. But when you think about it, Varys was more than the master of whisperers so cruelly thrown under the bus by Tyrion, once again proving himself incapable of reading situations properly. He was the personification of the realm and everything he did up to and including sanctioning murder was done for the good of the realm. Removing him took away the realm's dog in the final fight and therefore their protection. Him burning helplessly at Danny's word was the perfect mirror to what came later and it gave Melisandre another tick in her win column for correct prophecies. Number 9, Tyrion repays Jaime's favours and is in real danger. Quite why Tyrion thought telling Danny about Varys knowing Jon's secret would go down any other way than it actually did is completely illogical, but Tyrion hasn't always been the smartest sword in the armoury over the last few seasons. No wonder he hasn't had sex in years, he's too busy screwing everything else up. That joke worked better if you could say the F word on YouTube, but sadly you can't. But in revealing the betrayal, he took away his last lifeline, with Danny telling him that the next time he failed her, she'd have him killed, or words to that effect. Naturally, he's then put immediately into the impossible position of having to barter for Jamie's life when he's taken captive, as well as the lives of everyone in King's Landing, when he realises Danny will be unmoved in her plan to gain vengeance for Missande and Rhaegal's death. So he frees Jaime, repaying him for freeing him from his father's captivity so long ago, and immediately puts a target on his back. This was Tyrion's hero moment as he gave up his own life to save the millions of residents of King's Landing. In the end, both might be lost, but we definitely know he's in imminent danger right now. Number 8, The Mad Queen. After a few episodes teasing Danny's heel turn, God, those wrestling lads brush off on me way more than I want them to, the show pulled the trigger, having her live the destiny she hoped she would so dearly be able to avoid. The deaths of her closest friend and her boy Rhaegal were just too much, and having seen her allies depleted or distanced from her by betrayals and political machinations, she was isolated, volatile, and emotionally broken. Throw in a couple of days without sleep and food and you have some indication of Danny's mental condition as she's planning her raid on King's Landing, and then everything we see bubbling up inside her as she sits on top of Drogon on the King's Landing rooftops. As she rains fire down on the innocent residents, shockingly, Danny has ultimately relived her father's story. She is the Mad Queen and there is no way she could ever rule now with love. As she says herself, it'll be with fear. And while it could prove disastrous, it's understandable. We were meant to see her and Grey Worm's tragic payoffs as unavoidable because what happened to them. Number 7, John's Revelation. Though it cost him his life, Varys was right about Danny and Jon should have listened to him. Then again, hindsight is a wonderful thing and it's hard to argue against the sweet, sweet draw of your anti-sex when you've got Targaryen blood running through your veins. Your penis veins. I'm sorry, I'm sorry for that. 
Eventually, though, John does start to see the warning signs, which involve people being burnt to death, sexually assaulted, and massacred mere feet away from his own eyes. And then, finally, he had an epiphany. Essentially, Danny is bad now, John knows as much, and this can only lead to one reality. He and Danny are going to war, and he's going to have to cut his way through Grey Worm on the way there. This episode was heavily into the imagery of the true cost of war, with both Arya and John experiencing it all firsthand among the people of King's Landing, and both come to slightly different conclusions about violence. Number six, Euron got what he wanted. Few people in this godforsaken world ever seem to die on their own terms or with a smile on their face. So far, it's basically only been young Tommen and maybe Olena Tyrell, but both of those came at a huge cost. Everyone else is kind of left with unfinished business or was dragged into the void kicking and screaming. It's interesting to note then that one of the most detestable figures in the entire show's run, and also the most perversely charming, Euron Greyjoy, died smiling. Why would he though? He had a planned future and opportunity to be king, so why would he die happy? Well, because he got what he wanted, essentially. Euron's destiny in his own mind was to be notorious. He lived for his own legend, hence cutting out his crew's tongue so they preserved his truths. And the idea of becoming the Slayer of the Kingslayer and the Shagger of Queens got him way more turned on than any promise of power. Number five, this version of the prophecy came true. At times with this show, it's hard to keep track of when you're supposed to believe in the power of prophecies or when you're supposed to cast them off as frivolous and nonsense. We've been presented with some prophecies that were obviously dangerous nonsense and where interpretation was key, and yet at the same time, there were others like Danny's vision or Maggie the Frog's proclamation to Cersei that were basically irrefutable facts. The show's ideas of defying destiny comes down to looking into the face of death and either accepting it or saying not today. Remember, in the TV show, Maggie the Frog never mentioned the Valonqar element of the prophecy from the books. She merely said that Cersei would marry the king, would be cast down with a more younger, beautiful queen who would take everything she loved, and that she would have three children who would all wear golden crowns, but then would all die before her. And she did marry the king, Robert Baratheon. She did have three children who all died before her, and now she's been cast down by a queen younger than she. And for good measure, she took everything she loved as well, her unborn child her kingdom and Jamie in one fell swoop. In a continuation of the show's greatest irony, the prophecy came true because Cersei marched towards it ceaselessly. There was as much choice about her fate as there was fate. That's all important because Jon Snow now has to face up to his own destiny, either to live out the same cycle as Ned Stark, the valiant but naive hero destined to die, or become the chosen one by slaying Danny. Neither necessarily has to end with him on the Iron Throne, of course, but the point is that he has a choice in the matter. Number four, Clegane Ball, the House of Clegane Falls. After eight seasons and far longer in universe as Sandor Clegane confirms, we got Clegane Ball and it was certainly something. In the end, it wasn't just about two old rivals with unfinished business or a fetishized fight for our entertainment. It was harrowing and visceral and not an opportunity to revel at all. They absolutely destroyed one another, just as you have to imagine they were always destined to do and fell to their deaths through the crumbling wall of the Red Keep into a pit of fire. Still, you'd probably check on the mountain's body for signs of life one last time. I mean, who knows with this guy? The whole point of this matchup was also inherently tied to Aya's fate and future too. In the lead up to the fight, the hound freed her of her dangerous path that she's been walking on ever since drawing up her kill list. This was fundamentally a morality tale for her, with Sandor urging her to turn away lest she end up exactly like him, which every strange paternal instinct in him screamed for her to avoid. In that respect, it served a far greater purpose in the end than it might have seemed. Number three, Danny's eyes will turn back to the north. One of the biggest reasons that John has to deal with Danny pretty swiftly, without mentioning the fact that he's already just been partly responsible for the deaths of thousands of people in King's Landing anywhere, is that Danny almost outright tells him that once she's done with Cersei, she's going after Sansa. Just like him, her love has blinded her to the truth of her betrayal, which was orchestrated by Jon Snow from the moment that she said, don't tell anyone your secret as it will destroy me, and he did precisely that. 
She goes out of her way to blame everyone but John and claims that Sansa has won when she forces her hand to kill Varys, while also threatening Tyrion with a similar fate. It's pretty clear then that Danny will turn her attention back to Sansa and the North, where she felt absolutely no love and destroy her remaining enemies while also blaming her for making it so in the first place. Not only is she the Mad Queen incarnate, she also believes herself completely just in her actions. She's now dangerously close to making overt threats against the one thing Jon wouldn't be able to abide, his family. Number two, is Arya gone? What you think of Arya's future in this show depends on how you basically interpret the three different resolutions that her final scenes and that lovely white horse suggest. One is pretty simple in that Arya is dead and the horse is her dying vision. The second is that the horse represents freedom and is tied to the Hound's fate and everything she experiences during the decimation of King's Landing. Essentially, that sequence acts as her deprogramming of sorts, from the moment Sandor tells her to turn away through to her discovering the dead mother and daughter and her riding off at the end is a symbolic conclusion to that revelation. In either of those cases, you could reasonably expect that to be the end of Arya's story. After all, she did tell the Hound that she didn't plan to return to Winterfell. But then there's the third interpretation, which seems to be the most popular, that suggests that the appearance of the horse fits with the idea of Arya as the real harbinger of death who will deal with Danny just as she did the Night King. According to that theory, the fact that the horse is white is no mere accident. It's a callback to the Book of Revelation's description of death himself. Quote, And I looked and behold a pale horse, and the name that sat upon him was Death. Aya's insistence that she can't go back combined with her extensive training at the House of Black and White would certainly fit with her taking on that role. She also saw exactly what Danny's massacre meant to the people of King's Landing in an even more pronounced way than Jon. If there's anyone suited to enacting revenge on their behalf, it's her. Again, the beauty of this show is that at least two of those suggestions are very possible, and so is a fourth mystery answer that nobody is predicting. Number one, Danny will die. So after all this, we have to ask ourselves one thing. What the hell happens next? Only one thing is certain. This show cannot end with Danny sitting comfortably on the Iron Throne and everyone else still alive. The survivors are now basically split into Danny and Grey Worm versus absolutely everyone else. And there simply cannot be any possibility that Danny can win and everyone else is killed off. If we look back though, Danny does seem to have mapped out her own destiny already. In her own words, she has no desire to be the Queen of Ashes, and the moment she chose to relive the history of her father, the Mad King, that's all she could ever be. Jon won't allow her to attack his pack, the people of King's Landing would never accept her as their ruler after everything she's done, and she has become everything she hoped to avoid over her arc so far. There can be no ending other than her defeat and death, and the more you think about it, the more fitting it is that Jon Snow will be the one to kill her. So that's been our breakdown of everything that happened. I want to know what you guys think in the comments down below, what you thought of the episode, and while you're there, could you give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't, though, I've been Josh. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week for one last go-round. Bye.